we talk about the importance of all these all these games coming up and, and Villarreal and Chelsea and Arsenal. I mean, Adam, you must have sympathy with, with Ed Woodward because to, to find a break in the schedule where you could remove a manager and then take time to, you know, bring someone in and give them a bit of time must be very, very hard for him. Yes, I think, was it now like 11 games in the next 40 days or something like that? Um, I mean, it's inc- it is incredible. The, you know, to, to, to give, if you take it back to Gdansk, lose the Europa League final, I think after that, I don't think there were many people saying Solskjaer should be sacked, but I think there was a lot of people looking at it and thinking, can he take them to that next level? United doubled down. They said, he, we, we, you know, he is the guy. Let's give him a new contract. You then start this season, fine, starts reasonably well, but pretty, ro- you know, I think by, certainly by the Leicester game, um, it was clear there was a huge problem. But there was also Villarreal, Everton, Aston Villa, and then they gave, I mean, they're in talks with McKenna and Carrick about new contracts. This was only around a month or a month and a half ago. They Mike gave, Mike a new a new, one, yeah. gave Mike Phelan a new three-year a new three-year contract. And that's not any specific criticism of those people, but in terms of how blinded United were to the realities of where this project was going, it's it's astonishing. And then they essentially let Solskjaer continue because he lost, sorry, because he beat Tottenham which meant another manager who might have been available as a more short-term fix disappears in Antonio Conte. Um, then they let him stay after Manchester City. And, and now we're in this situation. I'm, I'm, I can't explain it. Uh, that, I mean, the explanation I was given yesterday was basically there were, there'd been so many instances of survivor's instinct from Solskjaer and recovery powers, both in his career as a player and manager that they just hoped that it would turn around. And I, I do think that's where it was that United was so drawn to this concept that because they gave time to Sir Alex Ferguson in the past, that it would work again with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And the, the world doesn't work like that. Adam rightly says United were trying to stick along with Ole, try, trying to make Solskjaer work. But anybody could tell that it wasn't working. That if they asked, you know, the people involved after the players, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a it was a irretrievable situation. So it, that you know brings me back to the people that are making the decisions, and clearly, you know they were quite happy. They, they wanted it to work, um, but they don't have. It seems to me the instinct to act proactively. It's all reactive and kind of well, we didn't expect this to happen. But if you actually drill down into the issues, you'd know that this is the way it was going to go. Um, and you know the jobs that they have have got for themselves. I mean, Ed Woodward. You know, resigned over the Super League supposedly that he couldn't back the Super League, but now we hear he's probably going to get a consultancy role. Um, you know, once he eventually steps down, and he's very much involved in this process here in terms of, you know, telling Ole Gunnar Solskjaer what was happening in terms of telling the coaches what was happening at Carrington uh, yesterday. So he's very much front and centre of this. Um, and then you've got Matt Judge, who you know has known Edward Wood for a long, long time from the investment world. Richard Arnold, all three of them went to Bristol University and United absolutely insist that they didn't all know each other at Bristol University, but it's, it goes back to the 1990s, the early 1990s. So that to me suggests that there's a, a kind of, you know, it's it's all about serving the Glazers' interest, which is, you know, making money from Manchester United. And as long as they're on the same page, that's fine. The football activities and, and being aggressive and being sharp and being ruthless is a kind of secondary factor. This isn't a cynical view. It's relaying things that we've heard from respected contacts, that they were desperate for Solskjaer to succeed because he was the ideal manager for them. He is not a guy that will aggressively try and take all of the authority and power and demand money for transfers. And that is said to be just the way (laughs) they want it, that they retain autonomy from the top to run this club in the way that they want. And one of the factors raised as to why Antonio Conte or a figure like him might not be so suitable is because he absolutely would challenge that. Jose Mourinho did to an extent, although it seems to have been one of United's more successful periods since Sir Alex Ferguson left. Um, and so perhaps that's why they gave him so long. And now on Laurie's point about uh, Ed Woodward, there are reports as we're recording this that uh, he's considering staying on longer in his existing role 
than uh, we were told he was meant to be going at the end of the year. Um, and, you know, ahead of putting this piece together that, that people can read on The Athletic, I was told that United were keen to make him a non-executive director and that they maybe thought that the passage of time since the Super League debacle would almost make people forget um, that he was a sort of conspirator in all of this and that he is meant to be leaving at the end of the year. And actually he would kind of just stick around and keep it going. And we can't forget that he was central to everything that's gone on in recent days. He was the man dealing with the Solskjaer situation, appointing his replacements at Carrington on the day it would all happen. In fact, I'm told that he was the driving force behind all of this, even if he doesn't rubber stamp it, that's Joel Glazer on behalf of the ownership. Ed Woodward, to use Laurie's phrase, remains front and centre just weeks before he's meant to be leaving the club. And as we understand it, hand over to Richard Arnold, although the club have never confirmed that. When you hear people saying that John Murta doesn't carry this level of uh, power that his resp- his position dictates, that people aren't quite sure um, if Darren Fletcher is, is right for the sort of technical director position that they've never seen in, in their careers, a, a technical director on the bench in a tracksuit and leading the warm up. Um, it all speaks of a hierarchy that uh, doesn't isn't quite fit for purpose, certainly not for the level of expectation of Manchester United. Um, and a key theme of what we hear from people around the club and the squad is a lack of clarity on who does what, communication, and then that filters down to the pitch, it would seem. And the dressing room is still having Carrick and McKenna. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's that's the interesting thing. Obviously, Michael Carrick and Kieran McKenna have been a key part of Manchester United's coaching staff going back before Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. They were part of Jose Mourinho's um, coaching staff. So if they're tired of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's voice, I mean, they must be exhausted um, of those two because it's a lot longer. Um, I think with Solskjaer, as the guys say, that I don't think it's a case of, you know, that they dreaded seeing him or they disliked him. I think it was a breakdown of trust, a a loss of faith um, that the person who was giving instructions was going to make them better or find the solutions. Um, and I think, we, you know, as we'd seen over the past two years, I mean, the amount of times United started a game badly, but then got back into it almost through personality or quality of moments. And that's just stopped happening in the last few weeks. And I think that speaks for, you know, there's only so far you can, you can be taken with that momentum of, you know, being respected and liked by the players. On those coaching points, Mark, um, We have spoken to people uh, around the camp who have picked up a feeling among some players that, well, it's the same guys. So what's going to change? And that is really pertinent. I think we've all heard that point, as in when we've been talking to contacts around, you've still got Michael Carrick there, you've still got Kieran McKenna there, they've done the coaching, they're still going to be doing the coaching. The reality is Man United have three huge games over the next week. Mm -hmm. They've got Villarreal, Chelsea and Arsenal. They can't fire an entire backroom staff if they don't have someone there to bring them in. Um, so I think that's one very, very practical element of it. They need someone to lay out the cones, hang up the hang up the kits, devise a, a, a tactics plan, do press conferences, all of that kind of thing. Um, and I think the other thing is they're not sure who is going to come in. Now, you might get at someone who is available as a head coach to be interim, whose usual staff might be in jobs at the moment or might not be readily available. So they might want to give that interim person the chance to look at, well, here's what this structure is at the moment. Who do you want to keep? And who do you want us to let go? So I think it's just giving themselves that bit of flexibility. And I think it's, you know, we've seen before interims turn into more permanent things at Man United. But I I do think the plan here is to try at least, you know, for this to be a very, very short interim, interim period. What's concerning is that those... Uh, nucleus of coaches with all due and total respect don't seem to have produced results for United or helped produce results for United, which leads to the question of whether they are the right people to be at the club. I agree in these days they probably need to be, but should this whole decision have been taken earlier and a much, um, I know it's not easy, a much better um, uh view taken on, on the coaching setup and and who are the right coaches to lead 
Man United forward. And that probably brings us back to the question of whether Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was right in the first place and whether the people above him are qualified to be making these decisions. It's very unusual to have this level of scrutiny over backroom staff, isn't it? I can't remember another situation really with a head coach where... I think Arsene Wenger Wenger got Mm. it a little bit towards the end, don't you? You, Adam, mm. certainly with with the length of time and maybe working with yeah. with Pat Rice and then and then discussions about what Steve Bold was was doing yeah. and whether he's going to use other, you know, former former Arsenal players as as part of his backroom staff. That that's the one that that's the one that springs to mind. Then how many of them would remain if, say, Maurizio Pochettino, the reported first choice candidate, is yeah. to come in? Yeah, clearly they would have to have a shake up, wouldn't they? And I suppose the one difference with United is that Solskjaer had clearly positioned himself as a manager. So, you know, therefore McKenna and Carrick are the guys out doing the training sessions, which is something that Ed Woodward, we're told, you know, wanted. He wanted this kind of continuity with Mm -hmm. a young coach bringing on young players. Um, And so that's why there's a scrutiny on them because they're the guys out there every day. Uh, So it's obviously different, you know, for example, at at Liverpool, maybe where Jurgen Klopp is obviously much more engaged in that department. Um, I suppose the one aspect this week, and Adam is right, it's huge games. I mean, the Villarreal game, you know, if they if they win that, they're through. Then then great. If they lose that, they could go out the Champions League quite easily, and that would be a disaster given the group that they've got. So really, Carrick now has been entrusted with this, you know, great responsibility. That's the difference. He he now picks the team. Solskjaer, and, and, I think the accusation I'm sorry. is that... I, I was just going to say, and what's hard on that, Laurie, and we've we've all probably heard this and alluded to it a bit, is, you know, and we've spoken about it already in this podcast, the players are not taking on instructions. It's not like they're going out without any instructions. They're, mm. they're, they're, either, deli- they're either deliberately ignoring the instructions or... Or, or they're incapable of carrying them out. And that that must be a concern going into these games. Or, or the instructions aren't very good in the first place, which again is still, you know, with same same sets up. I suppose the one, like I said, the one difference with Carrot picking the team is that Solskjaer had got his favourites. You could see that because, you know, in terms of, you, know, you say that's quite an, a good thing in that he's, you know, trying to create stability or he's, he's dependent on people that have produced for him in the past. That created this atmosphere a little bit where you had players thinking, well, what do I need to do to get in the team? Your seven players started all four of those defeats to Leicester, Liverpool, Man City and Watford. You know, you've got Aaron Wan-Bissaka playing every single minute of the Premier League so far and he's not been good. So really, Carrick now has a, has... I think should take the chance to shake up the team, you know, and, and maybe that could trigger some kind of reaction because, you know, the, the performance at Watford was a disgrace, really. 